Good morning. In today's headlines, it's one of the most powerful storms ever recorded in the U.S. We take a look at how Florida is doing after Hurricane Ian made landfall. A gunman is on the loose after six people were shot near a California school. Security is tightened in Scandinavia after the leaks in the Nord Stream pipelines. Some officials say the leaks were an act of sabotage. Find out what measures are being taken. Does Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney scare tech giants? Find out which speech of hers YouTube took down. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. And I'm Evelyn Lee. Good Thursday morning. It's September 29th. Let's start off the program with Hurricane Ian. It made landfall on Florida's southwest coast yesterday. The Category 4 storms center hit west of Fort Myers. It weakened as it moved inland, but the storm surge is causing major flooding in some areas. And today, Jeremy Sandberg has more on the hurricane's impact. Streets were turned into rivers in Fort Myers as residents took refuge on higher ground. Some who refused to evacuate were trapped in their homes. The storm's sustained winds reached up to 150 miles per hour, near Category 5 levels, the most severe status. Storm surge, rising levels of ocean water being pushed inland by strong winds, is threatening flooding across the state. The storm surge pushes water into, so you have every canal and river that usually drains that rain. The, it's gonna, they're going to flow backward. The water gets pushed into these areas, flows backward, and then that rainfall has nowhere to drain. So even if you're inland, you have dangers associated with the water. Officials are urging people to heed warnings and stay safe. People just need to uh, stay focused. They need to listen to their officials. They need to understand what the threats and the dangers are. Those first few hours, days after the storm passes are just as dangerous as when the storm is going over. The storm weakened to a Category 1 hurricane Wednesday night. Although hurricane and tropical storm warnings have been discontinued for southern Florida, citizens were reminded to remain vigilant. Even if you see the water receding, it's not the time to go out there and, and look at it or collect shells or whatever it is. We've seen this in the, these type of storms. When the winds come down, the winds, winds decrease, that water comes back in. It could be incredibly dangerous. More than two million homes and businesses in the state were without electricity Thursday morning. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is requesting that President Biden approve a major disaster declaration for all 67 counties in the state. When the storm passes, the federal government's going to be there to help you recover. DeSantis is also asking Biden to grant FEMA authority to provide 100 percent federal cost share for debris removal and emergency protective measures for 60 days after Ian's landfall. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Flood warnings in southern Florida are remaining in effect. The National Hurricane Center downgraded Ian to a tropical storm this morning. It's expected to weaken over the next few days, but it does have the potential to reach hurricane strength again as it moves over Florida's east coast. And in Naples, Florida, firefighters faced some unique challenges yesterday. Their station was completely flooded. About three feet of water covered the first floor. Firefighters kept busy despite the flooded streets. One fireman rescued a woman from her car in waist-high water. He smashed the car's window to get her out. He then gave her a life jacket and helped her to safety. Others turned to using jet skis to conduct rescues. The fire truck was out of commission due to the high water. A crew removed the truck from the parking garage. The Naples Fire Department posted a video of the scene. Let's take a look. Um, now we have a truck issue and the guys are pushing the truck out of the bay. Because why, Chief? Uh, it seemed like the truck was going to catch on fire. It was smoking and uh, we didn't want the station to burn down. We're now unloading the truck. Firefighters salvaged what they could from the fire truck. Hats off to them. They worked through the difficulty and adapted to the elements. And an aerospace engineer shared a video of his flight through the eye of the hurricane. He says it was the roughest flight of his six-year career. There goes the signs. There goes the beds. Holy cow. The hurricane hunter was on a reconnaissance mission to assess the storm. His job is to deploy an experimental unmanned drone to collect data. He says they don't do it for fun and that they are providing a public service to help keep folks on the ground safe. The data is used in tropical cyclone research and forecasting. 
seems like an intense job. Very important work they're doing to help protect, predict future storms. Yeah, and speaking of predicting, the National Hurricane Center says the storm should pass over Florida's east coast today. It's then expected to move through northeastern Florida, then onto Georgia and South Carolina along the coast Friday. Residents are being warned of potential storm surge in those areas. This is the forecast. This is the forecast that as Ian comes back out over the Atlantic and turns back to the northwest into Georgia and South Carolina, they themselves are going to have a significant storm surge. Now these numbers might seem low relative to these larger numbers that we've been advertising in Florida, but don't let this fool you. This portion of the coastline is very low and flat, and these numbers will be very impactful if they, uh, in fact, are materialized. The National Hurricane Center says there is a danger of life-threatening storm surge along the East Coast Thursday and Friday. The storm is expected to drop up to 20 inches of rain across central and northeast Florida, with some areas receiving up to 30 inches. The governors of Georgia, Virginia, North Carolina and South Carolina have all declared states of emergency in preparation for the storm's potential impact. Hurricane conditions are a possibility in those areas. And it's possible the path of the storm could change, so check back for new developments. We'll keep you updated. Now in Europe, Finland and Norway are closely monitoring developments after a gas leak in the Nord Stream pipelines. Some European authorities suspect foul play, but it remains unclear who was involved. Here's Entity's Kost Hemines with the story. Finland and Norway will watch their waters very closely after the Nord Stream gas leaks. Despite this, there is no sign of increased military activity in the Baltic Sea area, according to the Finnish defense minister. But Norway announced the military will be deployed near Norway's oil and gas installations following the suspected sabotage. It is unclear as of yet who is behind the leaks. Danish Foreign Minister Jeppe Kofod on Wednesday said the gas leaks were intentional. We, we got some disturbing uh, reports about gas leaks uh, in the... Um in Nord Stream uh, pipelines in the Baltic Sea. And then uh, when we start to look at it, uh, we can see that there's severe um, leaks. Uh, and with other data, we can now establish that uh, these leaks are caused by explosions. Colford said they will release facts in the coming days. He called the explosion an attack on European infrastructure and security. The European Union believes sabotage probably caused the leaks but has not named a potential perpetrator or suggested a reason behind it. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen stressed the need to protect critical infrastructure. EU Commissioner Valdis Dombrovskis said safety and environment remains the utmost priority. It's uh, clear that those uh, incidents are not coincidence. All uh, information available so far seems to be indicated that it has been a deliberate act, deliberate avalanche which was uh, uh, created. Russia, which slashed gas deliveries to Europe after the West imposed sanctions over Moscow's invasion of Ukraine, has also said sabotage was a possibility, but dismissed any allegations of its own involvement as stupid. Nord Stream pipelines were built with joint investments from Russia and European partners, costing billions of dollars. The pipelines burst in several locations in the exclusive economic zones of Denmark and Sweden, while neither of them was in operation. Kost Hemenes, NTD News. And the Swedish Coast Guard did find a fourth leak in the pipelines. So two of the leaks are on the Nord Stream 1 pipeline that recently stopped supplying gas, and the other two are on Nord Stream 2 that never started operating because of the war. Although they were not running, both pipelines were filled with gas, which has escaped and bubbled to the surface. So we're bringing in Catherine Porter for more. She's an energy consultant with Watt Logic, based in the UK. Good to have you, Catherine. Good morning. Well, it's up to four leaks now, so sabotage or not, what do you think? Well, it's almost impossible to imagine that this is an accident to have four ruptures on these pipes um, in such close proximity. Uh, you just cannot imagine any situation where this isn't deliberate. It's pretty unusual for these types of pipes to rupture um, and to have four happening all at once is, is just not accidental. I see, and we just heard that it's severe damage. Can Is this something that can be fixed? What does it mean for Europeans? 
these, I mean, in theory, they can be fixed. It's not clear how the impact of sanctions would play out with that, or even if uh, Russia would have the appetite to go and fix them at the moment. In terms of how this impacts Europeans, well, as you said, at the moment, the pipelines weren't operating and the market didn't really expect there to be any gas coming through either pipeline in the near future. Uh, so the immediate reaction from this itself is relatively small. But we've also had news in the last couple of days regarding the pipelines through Ukraine. And there, there's been a dispute between the Ukrainians and the Russians around the route that the gas has been taking. Um, and so the Ukrainian gas company uh, has taken Gazprom uh, to arbitration and Gazprom has responded uh, basically rejecting uh, the Ukrainian claims and saying that if it doesn't um, stop the arbitration, then it could place this um, operator under sanctions. Now, when Gazprom placed the Polish pipeline operator under sanctions, that meant that there was no more gas flowing through Poland. Uh, and so the market has been reacting to that and seeing this as all further threats to the remaining gas supplies from Russia into Europe. Mm. That's really interesting. And I really do wonder, from your perspective, what could be the benefits to damage you know, two non-operational pipelines? Or, yeah, what are, what are the benefits to that? Well, there are, there's been various speculation in the market. Um, some people have been speculating that um, by, by the pipes now being physically damaged, that might allow um, the Russian suppliers to declare force majeure, which would suspend all of the commercial contracts. It's really pretty unclear at the moment what the status of those contracts is. But if there's a force majeure in place, that would mean that um, the obligations that Gazprom had um, under those contracts would then become suspended and it would no longer have any financial penalties for not delivering the gas. However, if this turned out to be a deliberate action by the Russians, then that wouldn't qualify as force majeure. So this would be a fairly risky strategy. Um, another potential option would be that this could be an experiment to see whether it's possible to attack this sort of infrastructure undetected or in a way that it's not possible to prove who was responsible. Um, at the moment, this is an attack on Russian infrastructure in international waters. Um, and if Russia is responsible for that, um, there's not very much that anybody else could or even potentially should do about it. Whereas if you were to attack another country's assets in its own territories, um, then that clearly would be a significant escalation. Um, so this could be some sort of an exploratory action to, uh, to test a capability. Um, and then there are some other alternatives that would be around um, preventing any sort of reversal in the attitude between uh, Russia and Europe in terms of the gas deliveries. If the pipes are available for use, then obviously people can change their minds about whether to use them or not. But if they've been physically put out of action, then that isn't possible anymore. Right. That's a very interesting take on this. But we're running a little bit out of time. But just before we go, I do want to ask, how is Europe doing right now? You mentioned that the flow has been halted for quite a bit now. Um, how is Europe doing in becoming independent from Russia so far? I mean, Europe is now getting a lot of natural gas from the U.S. Uh, in the form of LNG. Uh, which extent, to which extent can that solve its gas problem? Well, it's a difficult thing to do in the short term. Actually, uh, the EU has done pretty well over the summer to fill up its gas storage and is reasonably well placed now to get through the winter, uh, providing we don't have too much cold weather. So very much, a lot depends this winter on what the weather turns out to be. But of course, getting through the winter is only the first part. Then you have to look at what's happening next summer and will Europe be able to refill its gas storage through the summer? And really, Nord Stream was being used this summer um, to build up those gas inventories. So it would be pretty difficult to re restore all of that gas in storage next year without any gas coming through Nord Stream. Um, and of course, we're seeing all of these temporary LNG facilities being developed, and hopefully that uh, Europe can buy enough gas to use those. Mm. Thank you so much for your take on this. Catherine Porter with Watt Logic. I appreciate it. You're very well. welcome. In other news, YouTube removed a speech made by incoming Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney. The speech was from the 2019 World Congress of Families. YouTube said it violated their community standards. The speech went viral and conservatives widely praised it. It's already been viewed over 20 million times on Twitter. In the speech, Maloney spoke in support of natural families, increasing the birth rate and restricting abortion. She also criticized the LGBT lobby, gender ideology, and prescribing puberty blockers to kids. She went on to denounce censorship and advocated for free nursery schools to help working mothers. After a strong outcry, YouTube backtracked and restored the video.
Critics such as Elon Musk have attacked censorship by tech companies, saying that a good sign as to whether there is free speech is if someone you don't like is allowed to say something you don't like. Perché la famiglia è un nemico? Perché la famiglia fa così paura? Perché ci definisce? Perché è la nostra identità? Perché tutto quello che ci definisce in questo tempo è un nemico? Per chi vorrebbe che non avessimo più un'identità e che, fossero, che fossimo solamente schiavi, consumatori perfetti. Non devo potermi definire italiana, cristiana, donna, madre, no. Io devo essere cittadino X, genere X, genitore 1, genitore 2, devo essere un numero. Perché quando sarò solamente un numero, quando non avrò più un'identità, quando non avrò più radici, beh allora sarò lo schiavo perfetto in balia della grande speculazione finanziaria. Il consumatore perfetto. Maloney also remarked that a low birth rate is one of the most serious issues the EU is facing, and she called for more investment into families. And coming up, a gunman is on the loose after six people were shot near a California school. And a teen was inspired in high school about a massive world problem. Now he owns a company tackling the issue. Stay tuned for more after the break. The Nation Speaks, we don't just scratch the surface. We want to go wide and deep. Our viewers come away with a much richer understanding of the issues of the day. We really make a big effort to bring on different voices onto the show. We don't just talk to experts and newsmakers, which of course are extremely important, but we also want to hear from the American people. So the people who are impacted by the policies and issues that we're talking about, because what they have to say is just as important to the national conversation. You're not going to get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at mhtsa.gov slash the right seat. Got a new house. I think I find a place that I call home. We're continuing with another shooting. Police in Oakland, California say six people were shot and injured near a high school yesterday. And today's Daniel Monahan has a story. Police in Oakland, California are searching for at least one gunman after a shooting near a school. Here's police captain Casey Johnson. So a little bit after 1245, officers responded to shots being fired. Upon arrival, our officers located six victims with apparent gunshot wounds. Paramedics transported six patients to hospitals, all with gunshot wounds. Oakland Mayor Libby Schaaf says the wounded were adults, and that the shooting happened at Sojourner Truth Independent Study. That's an alternative K-12 school in Oakland. The school's website says it serves new immigrants ages 16 to 21 who fled violence and instability in their home countries. It is one of several adjacent schools located on the same block. Two of the wounded were in critical condition at Highland Hospital in Oakland. The assistant Oakland police chief addressed the public. Anytime there's a shooting in our community, it's a complete tragedy. But as a parent, I completely understand the fear, the emotion, the panic when shootings are occurring at our schools with our young children, and it's completely and wholly unacceptable. The motive for the shooting is not yet known. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Survivors of a gun attack and family members of those killed filed multiple lawsuits yesterday. They accused Smith & Wesson of illegally targeting ads at young men at risk of committing mass violence. The shooting occurred at a Chicago-area Independence Day parade. Because they designed and marketed an m and assault rifle to do exactly what the shooter did on July 4th. The shooter was a shill for Smith & Wesson's marketing and advertising policy to do exactly what it wanted it to do. Sitting at a 4th of July parade in Highland Park, which has always been a place of safety, I would never have imagined that the turbulent sound I heard and hail of concrete fragments and shrapnel that I saw was actually a maelstrom of bullets from a Smith & Wesson M&P 15. 
The lawsuits are the latest bid to hold gun manufacturers accountable for a shooting. The group's strategy mirrors the approach used by relatives of victims of the 2012 Sandy Hook School killings. They reached a $73 million settlement in February with the firearm company that produced the rifle used in that attack. The case hinged on the family's accusation that Remington violated Connecticut consumer protection law and that it did so by marketing its AR-15 style weapons to young men already at risk of committing violence. Robert Cremo, the third stands accused of shooting into a crowd during a July 4th parade in Highland Park close to Chicago, he allegedly killed seven people and wounded dozens of others. We're going over to Brazil. Firefighters there say up to 15 people are are missing and three are confirmed dead. And another 14 were injured. That's after a highway bridge collapsed in northern Brazil on Wednesday. The bridge was over the Curaça River in the state of Amazonas. It happened while some vehicles were crossing the bridge. Local media quoted multiple witnesses saying the bridge had a crack that had caused the traffic jam before the collapse. Now locals are forced to cross the river in canoes. In other news, a company has created a robot to pick up trash and debris from the water. Entities Eileen Eng learned how it is done right where the robot is deployed. It looks like a floating Roomba, but this automated cleaner is called the Plastics Piranha, designed and engineered to remove plastics from the water. Michael Ahrens founded Clean Earth Rovers in 2017. I was very frustrated as an 18-year-old. I'm learning about this massive world problem. And from there, my inspiration and kind of obsession with the issue and, and who was out there and solving it grew very rapidly. He formed his team in 2019. They started building the rover in February 2021. It's come a very long way in just two years, and it's just such an awesome thing to finally see in the water. The rover can collect 100 pounds of waste per trip from skimming marina facilities. It holds the trash in the net attached to the front of the machine. It will skim the water for trash, dead fish, oil, And as it's doing that, it is also reporting the water chemistry to you. So you know if there are any toxins or algal blooms that are about to take place. And it helps with public health and safety measures, but also building data infrastructure around coastal waterways. There are limitations for picking up larger waste like logs. It doesn't actually have any type of image recognition on it. It uses a LIDAR system for collision avoidance. And then it does have a camera for live stream video that you can actually watch what it's picking up in live time. The fully electric rover can run for eight hours before requiring charge. Daryl, the owner of the San Pablo Marina, is happy to have it on his waters for three months. It's super easy to operate. Anybody can operate it. It's portable. It's you know, does the task it's designed to. Um, I think part of the reason that I was interested in having it here was to see how it would perform in a saltwater marine environment. A second rover is almost done. Aaron says it will be deployed in New York's Hudson River next month. Eileen Ang, NTD News, Richmond, California. Coming up, a one man's mission to bike across the country to honor those who have fallen and those who have survived. lasting beauty of realistic oil painting. Brilliant, expressive, and inspirational. The 6th NTD International Figure Painting Competition. Guided by pure authenticity, beauty, and goodness. Invites you to join us on a journey back to traditional art. The gold award is $10,000. For more details, please visit oilpainting.ntdtv.com. Welcome 
back. We're continuing with a retired army colonel who is doing a cross-country bike ride to not only honor fallen U.S. soldiers who fought in Afghanistan, but to also raise funds for the survivors. One mile down, 1,688 to go. For most cyclists, biking cross-country would seem like a grueling challenge, but for retired Army Colonel Chris Kalinda, it's a solemn mission. This bicycle ride is is, is, is part of that, just re respecting their service and sacrifice. You see, in 2007, Kalenda led a group of 800 paratroopers in Afghanistan on a particularly brutal tour. He lost six men. Their deaths are my responsibility. I, you know, I feel that every day. 15 years later, Kalenda will bike to each of their graves to visit them, to honor them, to ensure that they are never forgotten. Their names even etched on his bike. I want people to know them as flesh and blood Americans and not just as, as names on the, you know, etched in granite. So Kalinda rides, raising money for both his unit's veterans as well as for a scholarship endowment in the names of the fallen soldiers. I want to do something special to commemorate their service and sacrifice. Kalinda says he's raised more than $120,000 so far and counting. But this trek is also about the other 794 soldiers in Kalenda's unit. As of now, he's lost more men to suicide and overdoses than to the insurgents they once battled. I like to call it PTSN, you know, post-traumatic stress normal, because if you're normal, you are going to be affected by these experiences. There are people who are struggling with belonging and purpose, and we want to get them the resources and support they need. Kalenda has painstakingly mapped out each mile of his 28-day journey, visiting the grave sites and families of Sergeant Adrian Hike, Specialist Jacob Lowell, Staff Sergeant Ryan Fritchie, Captain David Boris, and ending in Arlington National Cemetery for Major Tom Bostick. Our unit was 91st Cavalry. Y'all are on Highway 91. But first, Kalinda starts here in Spalding, Nebraska, to pay his respects to Private First Class Chris Pfeiffer, surrounded by his loved ones and beloved community. Chris was always on top of it. And in a place like Afghanistan, when you can count on somebody to always do the right thing, that is absolutely invaluable. And with the cheers and support of new friends, Chris Kalinda sets off, determined to follow through on his mission, one pedal stroke at a time. Kalenda visited Adrian Hike's grave in Iowa on Tuesday. He says his mission is going well so far. Actually, here in the U.S., many suffer from PTSD. Like Kalenda said, he has now lost more former troopers under his command to overdoses and suicides than to deaths in combat. Yeah, hopefully the veterans can get all the support they need. And you know, Evelyn, that really is touching. What a great cause for those veterans. I totally agree. But we have to go now. We'd love to hear from you. You can share your thoughts and your story at goodmorning at NTD.com. So shoot us an email if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.